Welcome to the A16Z podcast. Uh, I'm Tani Olguin, and today we have with us Keisha Cash, who's the founding partner of Impact America Fund. Welcome. Thank you, Tani. So I think today we wanted to talk about a few things. Uh, we wanted to talk about the early stage investing landscape, how that's changed. Obviously, uh, it's the costs of starting a company are so much lower, so that means there are more companies emerging very early. Uh, there's a lot of wealth now that's being circulated, and in the investing space, in venture capital, there's a lot of interest, a lot of people who are maybe new to tech, don't know much about technology, uh, but they're interested in, in kind of getting into this. So you're seeing a lot of new angels and a lot of people flooding angel list, forming syndicates. So, you know, how do you interpret that, especially taking a focus with Impact America Fund on looking at the early stage companies, ideally with a social impact? Tell us more about what that means to you. Yeah, we actually, um, you know, our investment thesis, we're investing sort of pre or post seed stage, um, pre Series A and then participating Series A and going forward. Um, and because of our mission, you know, we're investing in underserved uh, companies that impact underserved communities in America. The types of companies and opportunities that are particularly interesting to us are oftentimes very unfamiliar to those folks who mm -hmm. you're talking about that have uh, money to invest, they're new angels, et cetera. So we spend quite a bit of time educating um, individuals on what this means mm -hmm. in terms of investing in companies to impact underserved communities in America. Um, and interesting enough, there recently, um, JP Morgan and the Global Impact Investment Network, GEN, uh, released their annual survey of impact investors. Uh, so the survey says they, they, they interviewed or surveyed 146 um, impact investors around the globe. And these impact investors account for about $60 billion of um, assets under management. $10 billion was invested last year. And these are larger investors, foundations, pension funds, um, et cetera. Um, and, I, and I read through some of the report. I need to read the rest of the report. Um, but something that stuck out uh, at me was that um, over 91% of that capital was invested into later stage companies. So there's a clear gap um, of seed capital, venture capital, um, early stage capital that's available for um, new innovations and in impact investing. So everyone talks about, you know, there's sort of a lack of capital um, at the on the risky side, and people are trying to convince, you know, the foundations and others to play in that area. So for us, you know, we are, you know, we think that there's capital out there, and there may be capital out there that's unfamiliar with opportunities that are several above and beyond um, kind of traditional tech plays. In right. Our opinion. Right. So, Keisha, can you just help us understand what is impact investing? There are a lot of different terms and <laughs> meanings for impact investing, depending on where you sit on the spectrum. Um, I will, you know, give you kind of the the global impact investment network definition of impact investing that Great. I tend to follow and many others do. Um, but it really, you know, if you're an impact investor, you are investing in a company or an organization to generate um, not only financial returns, but also social environmental and, and environmental returns. So that means actually a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a spectrum of how to invest that capital. Some folks are okay with below market rate returns. Others mm -hmm. are shooting for, like our fund, Impact America Fund, we're shooting for market rate or above returns. And then there's a spectrum of, you know, of people in the middle. Um, and then from an impact standpoint, you know, people, there, there are groups of people, individuals who are diehards and care about the environment, and they want to invest all their money into um, environmental issues. There are others that are concerned about the food system and food right. justice. Um, there are others who are concerned about education. And so within the um, sort of larger context of impact investing, there are these sub sort of cultures or sub networks of people who are particularly interested um, in different social or environmental issues. Gotcha. I find it fascinating to think about striking the balance between, you know, and you mentioned you're more on the side of the scale where you're focused on, you know, financial returns as much as, uh, you know, the social impact, right? So how do you measure these things? And, and how is social impact measured when you're surveying investment opportunities? There's an organization called Gears, and they are an impact measurement organization. It's a nonprofit. Um, and we are Impact America Fund is a geared certified fund. Our portfolio companies will complete an annual survey each year based on certain metrics that are relevant to that company. And it basically says, here's a baseline of where you're at from an impact standpoint. Um, there are other organizations that are working on, you know, different ways of measurement internally. 
for ourselves because we care about the impact um, of other underserved, low and moderate income communities in America, we're creating our own um, benchmarks and metrics internally to say, hey, look, what's important to us is job creation. Um, what's important to us is that um, your value chain, whether those are your employees, uh, your suppliers, your end users, that there's some value there. There's impact there. Um, there's an organization, Transform Finance, and they you know, tend to be a bit more progressive where they are, you know, you got to look at this. We want to make sure that there's more value um, input it, that's being input than, than, than we're extracting. Um, and so you have uh, various ways of thinking about impact measurement um, and the valuation of that impact. Gotcha. You mentioned underserved communities. Help us understand, in your mind and in what you're looking at, who, what are these underserved communities that you're that you're targeting? Yeah, we are. You know, I guess taking a step back. I grew up low income. I grew up low income. Fortunately, I grew up low income in Orange County, California. So while you know my family, we use food stamps at the grocery store. We were on Section Eight housing. Um, I had the benefit of a great public education. Um, my father, who my you know he's in South Carolina. My mother left my father and, and brought us from South Carolina, a very low income area to Orange County, California. Um, my father doesn't read or write. Uh, and so for me, being first generation college student, having the benefit of a great public education, um, going on to work in, you know, Wall Street and in and, and various other activities, um, I recognize because of how I grew up as a low income individual, the opportunities that exist uh, really in low income communities. Um, and so for us, the way that we define sort of underserved communities are markets um, with uh, with untapped potential. These aren't markets that are, you know, th th these are markets where there is high potential in these markets. Um, the human beings in those markets are assets and they're doing great work um, and they need a little bit more support in terms of, you know, technology solutions, in terms of business infrastructure, um, in terms of creative ways to think about how to better manage um, their businesses or how to better manage, you know, if you're a teacher, your data in schools. And so for us, it's, you know, looking at underserved communities, particularly interested in low and moderate income communities, believing that there are inefficiencies, um, looking at ways to cut those inefficiencies to generate more income um, and more outcomes for that community. So what do you think the role of impact investing should be for the kind of traditional venture capital community? How you know, if, do you have a greater message and how do you think about working with larger firms, you know, like ours or others in the community, um, educating them on the space and introducing them to the kind of companies that are leveraging technology in a way that's serving, you know, underutilized or untapped markets and un underserved communities like you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I mean, we are truly, we stand, you know, one foot on one side and one foot on the other in terms of impact, the way that we think about our investments in the way a traditional venture capitalist would think about their, invest their investments. Um, we believe that there are billion dollar market opportunities in underserved communities. There are people that are making, you know, plenty of money on underserved communities, whether it's financial services, whether it's health and wellness, whether it's education. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in our opinions, these markets, um, there, are, there are plenty of also market failures where um, low-income people tend to spend more on uh, basic essentials. And yet the quality of those basic essentials and basic needs is poor. And so we believe, you know, by working with um, traditional technologists and traditional technology investors, we have a lot to learn um, and believe that there are tools that can enable and essentially undercut um, these traditional Traditional markets that have taken advantage for many years of vulnerable populations who haven't had options um, otherwise. So they are stuck paying high fees. They're essentially being penalized for being poor or penalized for not having a lot of money. And when you don't have a lot of money, you typically don't have a lot of time. And so you're late and your fees are high when you're late. And I, you know, I saw my mother go through this when I was younger. Um, and it's just not fair. And so we wonder why there's no upward mobility in communities. The, the extra income that they have, they're spending on ridiculous amounts of fees and prices of services services and products that are poor quality and aren't actually helping them advance. How do you dispel, uh, and I don't know if this is a disbelief, that impact investing comes across as charity? You know, how do you make that differentiation and, and what lesson can we learn from that? 
Yeah, no, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because we are even as an impact investment fund and we have investors in our fund, um, you know, we're, you know, have thought carefully about how we present our fund and that we want to generate returns for our, our investors. And we also believe in impact, right? And uh, most folks are still of the notion that you have to choose one or the other. And because impact um, is not new, it's been around for many years, um, uh, but because it's sort of a new mainstream concept, it's still people tend to feel like it's something less than um, what, you know, a traditional venture firm would invest in or traditional market would have an appetite for. So for us, it's less, you know, about I think the best way for us or our approach to dispel in the myth is to prove it out. Mm -hmm. Um, There are folks that are impact investors who are okay with below market rate returns. We think that um, there hasn't yet been a really, um, I guess, uh, interesting uh, approach to investing in underserved communities in America. And typically, the people who have been investing in those communities don't look like the people in those communities. So Mm -hmm. I think with um, the structure of our team and who I am being from the community, that we have a unique positioning where we can identify real opportunities um, in the community that, again, people, we aren't making up a new business model. People are spending money on these businesses already. And for us, it's identifying the inefficiencies, identifying the cost savings, identifying where people within the value chain can can get more value out of their participation um, in these economies. And for us, we think if we can create a win-win for the community and investors, then everyone walks away happy. So you said impact investing is not new. So who has done it and and how has it worked in the past? Yeah, great question. Um, And so just thinking about over 100 years ago, um, when I think about Madam C.J. Walker and as a businesswoman and an African-American businesswoman, the type of business she built and why she built that business. And she was, you know, the creator of hair products and manufactured her own hairline, uh, um, hair care products. And the interesting thing about her model is she built a national network of agents, of women who she trained, who trained other women. And, um, you know, we, we applaud her for becoming one of the first um, female millionaires in this country. Um, but, but really, when you look at the core of that business model, it was about empowering mm-hmm. women. Um, and the majority of those women, um, in her case, were African-American women. And so you look at the context of her providing a product to an underserved market who, um, you know, has a complex. Uh, a hair texture um, and you know some days it's straight some days it's curly and figuring out a product that worked for that market but in addition to simply selling a product that worked um, she created this national network to empower other women to make money off of selling that product and so when you think about you know if Madam C.J. Walker was an entrepreneur today um, starting uh, her business for us that would be an impact investment um, given that she's empowering these women she's created this national network um, she's providing them an opportunity to generate income. Mm -hmm. So I know that in your portfolio, there's actually a company that now is catering towards women, uh, female stylists in in the African American community. Um, It seems to be a natural kind of progression from from the story that you just mentioned. Tell us more about that company. Yeah, Maven uh, is an e-commerce platform and um, led by a brilliant founder, Deshaun, um, and a co-founder who's just as brilliant. Um, But essentially what the company does is... um, Hairstylists, at least in African American communities in particular, uh, for many years have been free sales reps uh, in their communities. And um, the majority of African American hairstylists, um, they don't uh, inventory, they don't hold or manage inventory, right? They, and most of them, I'd say, probably can't afford to do that um, or may not, you know, just have the understanding of how to do that. Um, and so what's happened for many, many years in the community um, is that me as a hairstylist, if you're my, you know, client, Tani, and you want, you know, hair extensions, uh, and I will install those hair extensions for you. Um, Prior to that appointment, I'll recommend you to buy your hair extensions, um, either at the Corny Beauty Supply Store, or you'd make a decision about where to buy those extensions. But nine times out of 10, I'm going to recommend a Corny Beauty Supply Store. Uh, The problem with that is that uh, the majority of those Corny Beauty Supply Stores aren't owned by um, the majority of the people in that community. Uh, And the stylist being a free sales rep, doesn't make a commission off of referring um, her clients to that corner beauty supply store. So what Maven is doing is disrupting 
a piece of this um, supply chain, um, really by building his own supply chain, uh, the company supply chain. And now instead of me as a stylist recommending my client to the corner beauty supply store, or in some cases, in many cases, um, you know, my client and, and, and me as a hairstylist, we are located in um, areas where there's not a corner beauty supply store, right? And so then I have to drive. I have to drive an hour or two hours to get what I need in order to um, uh, then get the service that I need from my hairstylist. So Maven saying, hey, look, we're going to leverage technology. Um, We're not inventing, you know, the next rocket to go to the moon, but we're going to leverage technology uh, to say, hey, hairstylist, now you have an online portal on Maven and send your clients there. And for every product that they buy um, on Maven through your web, through your portal, you get a commission check. And then the part that I love the most about this model, right? It's a, it's a big market opportunity, black women over index and hair spending. We've heard the stats. I think a lot of folks are talking about in the mainstream, but what I enjoy most about this model and why we invested in this company um, sort of pre-series A um, is because the founder views the hairstylist as an asset. And he knows that that hairstylist um, is a key driver to the revenue growth um, of the business model. And so for a hairstylist who on average um, in America makes $24,000 a year, and oftentimes are working uh, additional jobs to support their family. Receiving an additional $100, $200, $300 check each week is significant. Is significant. Yeah, and the costs of of maintaining, purchasing inventory up front, you're alleviating all of that, right? So they don't have to worry about where are they going to get money, where are they going to store all this inventory, introducing them to technology. It feels like there's some really broad sweeping network effects by just implementing this e-commerce platform for this entire community. How do you guys think about what comes next and how, you know, this is just the beginning and how, what are the network effects from there? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, a, a great um, observation in that um, really, you know, Maven is meeting the stylists where they're at. And in sort of impact investing land, there's, you know, some folks have some great ideals about how communities will advance and uplift um, our approach to impact investing. And while we're, um, you know, greatly, deeply appreciate the Maven model is that he's, he's meeting that stylist where they're at. And once he um, is loyal to that stylist mm-hmm. and, you know, that stylist doesn't have to do anything else other than what they're doing and what they love doing, stylists are artisans. They've been artisans, right? And yeah. so they have a skill. They, they have a talent. And so to the extent that he can help that individual um, further their skill and their talent mm-hmm. and to make more money doing it and maybe not take that second job or, you know, work less or, you know, whatever the, whatever the situation is, he creates a loyal customer base. Mm-hmm. And then that loyal customer base, the, the, I think the sky's the limit in, in regards to um, – then distributing uh, other products and services that are well that will benefit the community. Tani, you know, we had an early discussion about Maven, yeah. um, and uh, Andreessen led the Series A round. Um, why, you know, for you, this is a company that you understand mission and you appreciate impact, um, but you all are a serious traditional technology investor. Did you all consider, um, you know, the impact piece, or why did Andreessen yeah. lead this round? I think that's really interesting. So with my particular focus being on early stage, um, you know, we we invest across all sectors, all stages. Um, so we're still investing at the seed stage, but we have to be very careful where we do invest. So a big part of my effort is finding untapped areas, not relying on on the traditional expected companies to come to us for those fundraising opportunities, but instead kind of being more proactive and seeking out new spaces. This is a perfect example. When you and I, you know, first met, the the companies that we talked about that you had already discovered and invested in, there were great opportunities for us to leverage the support system, the operational, you know, infrastructure that we have here as a firm, introduce them to you know, the more traditional route and and show them ways uh, that we can be of value. Um, not with the expectation necessarily that, you know, we are definitely going to invest or looking for an investment. But as it turned out, you know, Dushan is a very, very compelling founder and his mission and his connection to the concept that he that he's really building a business around, I think, is what has compelled us all and is really inspiring and empowering. And we do see that huge market potential, um, you know, and on top of that has a serious impact on an underserved community. And I think we do 
think about the network effects and what this could possibly mean for, you know, introducing technology, leveraging technology in these spaces, you know, software eating the world. This is just part of that. This is just the beginning of that. So there's a meme around uh, mission-driven founders versus mercenaries. And what does that mean to you? And why is that an important debate? Yeah, I've heard the debate. Um, I've heard the two terms sort of tossed around. You know, it's for us, honestly, uh, the companies that we currently have currently invested in under sort of the old umbrella I worked on, I uh, worked under the companies we invested in then. None of the companies, um, to be honest, uh, I self-identified as mission-driven investors. Mm. So for us, or mission-driven entrepreneurs. Um, and so for us, uh you know, we are sort of putting that label on the types of companies we invest in as mission-driven entrepreneurs, but they did not come to us saying, hey, look, I'm an mission-driven entrepreneur. Mm. I'm seeking impact capital. Um, while we were able to find them is we sought them out, right? They're not in our impact investment networks. They're not at the impact investing conferences. Uh, the entrepreneurs that we've invested in un- understood a pain point based on their own experiences. And we're building great, solid companies around that pain point. And it happened to overlap with our thesis that there are large market opportunities in underserved communities. So while I understand there's a debate out there, um, and I understand the debate of, of an entrepreneur, you know, going out seeking purely financial returns or, you know, a mission-driven entrepreneur who wants to do good by the world. Um, I don't know what you call the types of entrepreneurs we invest in. You know, for lack of better words, we call them mission-driven. But these are solid, Mm -hmm. business-savvy entrepreneurs that can stand up against any other entrepreneur, traditional or not, um, who care deeply about, uh, you know, generating a social or environmental return as well as a financial return. So it's, you know, hopefully, you know, my my hope and my prayer is that this becomes a mainstream phenomenon, mm-hmm. that it's not OK to just build a business for business sake. But there's a purpose and a real true purpose for that right. business to exist beyond generating uh, purely financial returns. Yeah, that doing good can be good business. Right. Dispelling that that myth. Mm-hmm. In Silicon Valley, we tend to see companies uh, emerge that are trying to solve problems that we face as people in Silicon Valley. You know, so how do you, in terms of seeing impact investing really manifesting, mm-hmm. uh, what does that start to look like? You know, and I, I kind of start to envision it as, as seeing more companies that are catering to people outside of this mm-hmm. space, right? So when you envision this, you know, manifesting, becoming the norm, the mm-hmm. mainstream, how does that look to you? Yeah, there are a few different sort of visions of of what that looks like. So A, when, you know, I've said before, um, investors talk about investing in best in class. And I was like, oh, that's really tough to do when the full class isn't there, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we get outside of what a traditional entrepreneur looks like or outside of um, what a traditional entrepreneur has access to and you begin to reach diverse communities and that diversity can mean a whole host of things, right? It could mean I live in a region, you know, I could live, you know, a a rural white region um, as well as, you know, an urban inner city that's majority black. So when we get outside of kind of that traditional framework, um, I think we start to see new and creative innovations. And what we've seen, uh, the work that I did with my previous I worked with a family office and sort of a radical um, progressive angel investor, Josh Melman. And our initial investment thesis was we're going to invest in entrepreneurs of color and we want to invest in mission driven entrepreneurs of color. Um, He invests capital. He managed capital for a very high net worth individual female that remains anonymous. Um, But that was our thesis. How do we get more capital in the hands of of of, of entrepreneurs of color. And so after doing that for three years, what emerged as really the thesis for Impact America Fund, the dedicated fund that I now uh, manage, um, was that investing in diverse entrepreneurs is important. But the theme that emerged out of that for me was nine times out of 10, if I met an entrepreneur of color, they were addressing a pain point in an underserved community. And that unfortunately, still in America, um, low income communities um, look like, you know, they're majority black and brown people. So I think it's fair to say as well is you know what you know, right? And um, if you're unfamiliar with a market and our job is uh, to bring more familiarity to markets that you may not know about. If you're, you know, a white man and you grew up in Silicon Valley, I don't expect you to know what's going on in, you know, necessarily in Detroit or what that community actually needs. I think what we do expect um, as this new economy emerges, that people are willing to work together. And so um, what we'll see uh, when this works 
and that people uh, begin to create solutions for um, real true pain points and what people need, we're going to hopefully see a radical change in um, the way that uh, black and brown folks fare on the health indices, the way that black and brown folks fare in education, um, the way that black and brown folks fare in uh, income and the racial wealth gap. And so for us, this is much bigger than um, finding the next home run. We want to prove this out because if we can prove this out, there's more capital that will be injected towards these needs. So yeah, I want to create the next gold rush to underserved communities. If we do that and stay true to the mission of impacting these communities, we're going to see a radically different, hopefully, um, uh, way of being for underserved communities and providing a real clear trajectory or, or a clearer path to upward mobility. Well, I just want to thank you so much, Keisha, for joining us for our podcast today. And it's great talking to you again. Thank you, Tani. It's wonderful to be here.